Welcome, everybody. My name is Matt Pearsall. I'm the community manager at Committee for Children, which is an education nonprofit and one of the hosts, along with Eli, of the CMX Connect education nonprofit sector chapter. I'm really glad to have you all here joining us today for, I, I am super excited and I assume hopefully y'all are as well because you're here, event where we're going to be talking with some of the leading education, non education community managers around. These are all people who have been finalists or winners of CMX, CMX's uh, Community Professional of the Year Awards. Go through and introduce everybody. First, I'd like you all to meet Medina McKinney is the board president of the Black Parents Association of San Mateo Union School District, High School District. She's also the owner and founder of iSpy Marketing. She is a highly effective and innate leader with over 20 years of event experience, nine years leading a nonprofit, eight years of program management experience, and several years of training in coaching and mentorship. Through excellent communication, a calm demeanor, skillful management details, and resourceful problem-solving skills, Medina thinks and works outside of the box to make dreams and goals a reality. She strives to bring out the best in others and herself so that everyone wins. Medina's work has taken her from engagements with Electronic Arts, General Electric, California Bank and Trust, CCC Fair, the San Mateo Union High School District we just talked about, UC Berkeley, to Facebook. And she is one of she was one of the finalists for the 2022 CMX Education Community Professional of the Year Awards. Next person I'd like you to meet is Lisa Kuntz. Lisa Kuntz is the Director of Strategic Operations at Indiana University Alumni Association. At the Detroit, is the Director of Strategic Operations for the Indiana University Alumni Association. Lisa streamlines internal business processes and systems, oversees the strategic development and implementation of enterprise-wide initiatives, and manages the overall progress of the IUAA's strategic plan. Helping further the UI, IUAA's commitment to continuous improvement, Lisa leads a cross-functional team responsible for creating efficiencies in workflows and operations and ensuring the alignment with organizational priorities. Lisa is certified in strategic doing. By the way, I don't know what that is, but I really want to be certified in strategic doing as well. Uh, strategic doing, trained in design thinking by the Stanford D School and has extensive experience in professional development, strategic planning, project management, change management, and loves all things data and design. Lisa is also one of the finalists for the 20. 2022 CMX Ed Community, Education Community Professional of the Year Award. And finally, our third panelist is Caitlin Warren. Caitlin is the Community and Teacher Marketing Lead at Class Dojo. Uh, Class Dojo is a school communication platform that teachers, students, and families use every day to build close knit communities. In her role, Caitlin oversees the Class Dojo community where educators from around the world come together for support, education, and the sharing of ideas. She oversees the engagement strategy and structure of all of our community spaces. She also plans, drafts, and executes marketing campaigns to support, engage, and encourage sharing among Class Dojo teachers. And Kaylin is the was the winner of the 2021 CMX Education Community Professional of the Year Award. And as a side note, when I first stepped into my role as a community manager, Kaylin was incredibly generous in helping tell me what the heck I should, helping me on figure out what the heck I should be doing and pointing me in the right direction. And I have been shamelessly copying everything that she does to the, whatever extent possible in my own work. So everybody welcome. And thank you very much for joining us. So let's start up the theme, the, 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 the meta theme for what it's worth for today is me about what's the, what's, what sets managing communities in the education space apart? What's special about this particular kind of niche in within community professionalism? And I want to start off with kind of a, a quick question for all three of you. And it's going to be, I want you to describe what's unique about the community that you support in three sentences. Medina, would you like to start off? So the Black Parents Association of the Cerrito Union High School District is a truly unique community. We are a diverse, multi-ethnic volunteer group. And we are different because you have your local like PTAs and PTOs and other parent organizations, which are localized at each individual school site. But BPA, we tie together an entire network of schools across a whole entire district in a very inclusive way. So our nonprofit is the only organization on the peninsula that supports students district-wide. So that's seven high schools and then three neighboring schools with wraparound programming. That means that we engage about 300 families 
within the district and then our district partners. So we are quite supportive on a widespread level in the work that we do. Thank you. Caitlin, how would you describe your community? Yeah, our community is unique because Class Dojo kind of belongs to our community. Everything we've built has been because a teacher said they wanted it or they needed it. Um, and continuously, they provide us honest feedback. It's constructive and kind because they're teachers who are giving us this feedback. And we don't do like district mandates or school plans to purchase. We're 100% free. So the reason Class Dojo is in, has become what it is and it's in, in so many schools is because teachers love it and have shared it and really have owned Class Dojo in a sense. And Lisa? Yeah, so our community is unique um, because we're huge. So uh, Indiana <laughs> University is very uh, decentralized. We have nine campuses across the state of Indiana, uh, the main campus, the hub being in Bloomington, uh, where I am. And so we have almost um, 750,000 alumni worldwide, and which is amazing and it provides some great opportunities. However, keeping engaging all 750,000 is quite challenging. And there are layers to that, some that are a bit closer to us. The Alumni Association, we are a member program, but I would say that that is what makes us unique. 750,000? Mm -hmm. Almost, That's, yeah. Yeah. I want to go, I already want to go off script a little bit on, on the questions and ask a little bit. I just want to know a little bit more about each of your communities. What does your community look like? How do people, for, for those of us who are new to them, how do people connect and engage with each other in your communities? Lisa, since I'm really curious about how 750,000 people connect, I'd love to know. Yeah, so I may start at a different point and hopefully arrive back at answering your question, but <laughs> so we actually had to really, because of our size, really had to hone in the last several years on a much more intentional strategy to engage our alumni. So in the past, it has been trying to be all things to all people. We've done spent a lot of time doing some research around alums affinity towards the university and the answer is it's just there could be almost 750,000 reasons why they feel attached to the university based on their unique student experience and we really had to get smarter about how we were trying to engage them because it's impossible we have limited resources to try to be all things to all people and one of the things that we did was we are one of the more centrally located units across the university and so we have a unique position to provide access to those things that they, that drives their affinity for the university. So I would say, generally speaking, that is how they, that is a, how they connect with one another around with who and around what made their student experience special to them. And it, it sounds like you're actually doing your work right now. Jess in the chat is saying that she's a, a UI, an IU alum. So yeah, go Hoosiers. <laughs> Caitlin, what is your community? What is your, how does, what does your community look like? Yeah. So we are also massive because <laughs> we consider any teacher who uses class dojo a part of our community. And that's really hard to bring that many people together. The place that we currently bring them together is we do host our community on Facebook. And so it, within that community, we're only like a very small fraction. There's 60,000 members who come together. Um, and share ideas and resources, ask questions. But the way we try to reach everyone is that's the reason I do a lot of like teacher marketing as well, because we do some content and other things that try to support teachers and what they do as well. And Medina, what does your community look like? So our community is filled with our students, their families, faculty and staff, other community leaders, and we also work with other um, community leaders and nonprofits, we come together through our programming. So we offer what we call like unity in the community, which is a quarterly meeting. It's a virtual town hall and we bring up relevant topics for the community. I mean, it's based on what they need. So we ask for, and then we deliver the order. So it's programming that basically fits what they're asking for. And from that, we do a lot of breakout sessions where yeah. we're sharing their actual voice. And then we will create programming based on those needs, or we will figure out if there's any policies or initiatives that need to be born at. 
And we come back every quarter with the results from that. But then there are a lot of student led initiatives where we give opportunities for our students to actually have leadership roles. So it's different depending on what the needs are, but it's, we don't have thousands like you all, but I am so excited to one day be as large as both Lisa and Caitlin's organization. So it's a little bit smaller because our district is not as big. We have more of a niche market, but we are wanting one day to grow to be more of a BIPOC looking organization. But right now it's mostly focused on black and multiracial families. So a little bit smaller community than the others. But it's great that you're bringing in, that you're bringing in student voices, getting that, that engagement just across ages. I think that's really powerful. Absolutely. So we can have. I love the fact that it's very much multi-generational. So you can have your student, but then you can have a grandparent or teachers and also it's certificated, but then it could also be someone who works in the office. So you hear so many different dynamic voices and it's such a beautiful like mixture of things also offering program instruction. So it's not that we are always creating the programs. We're taking the lead from our community on what they need and then answering the call. So the next question I think is been heard a little bit about your communities. I wonder if you could speak to what do you think makes sets the work that you do within your communities as a, as a community manager, as a community professional, what sets your work apart from the work that you have done with other communities or, or hear about other community professionals doing what's, what is different to you about working in the education sector? Would you like to take it? That's a really good question. Actually, I think the work that we Parents Association, like I said, is really centered on hearing and seeing and valuing what the community needs and then cultivating that type of work. It's not that we run our organization like a business because in my mind's eye, it is, but it's not necessarily we're creating our strategic plan just solely based on what we think they need. We truly take their voice and use that as our nerve star. So like our mission is truly elevating the voices of our youth and making sure that they are living to their highest potential. But then we are giving them the resources that they need to be successful. And then we're removing the roadblocks for them in order to like truly chart their way to college success. So it's not just getting there, but it's then also completing it. So the work that we do is completely in collaboration and partnership. And then we're taking a step further and we're working with the folks in the community who truly have a philanthropic heart to make it possible because it's their dollars that make our program successful. So it's a little bit different. It's truly about connection and partnership and collaboration with all the different entities within the community to make all of it possible for our students' success. Lisa, how do you see your work as being unique? Yeah. So I, one thing that I think is unique about our work is like, perhaps this is a bit more of an inside insider's perspective, but is the number of stakeholders we have in our work and how the role that they play in the work that we do. So we are our own 501c3, but we are tied to the university. Essentially, the university is our, our biggest donor, essentially. So clearly they have a, a big stake. They're a big interest in how we engage alumni to stay engaged with each other and back to university. We also have, and that it's not it's the university as a whole, but it's also all of the schools and campuses that fall within that system, because ultimately that's where alums graduate from. They graduate from a school or a campus. Um, but also we have a relationship with our um, foundation, which is the fundraising arm of the university. They are sister organization to us. We have shared resources in terms of staff. So I would say for us in terms of education, which I, I'm assuming it's probably um, not quite the same in other markets. Just the role that stakeholders play in our work is uh, a bit different. And Caitlin, what makes community managing a class dojo different? So I kind of, I, I laughed when I first heard this question because you don't see a lot of community managers like in like media, so to speak. And I've been watching recently uh, Mythic Quest on Apple TV. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but they introduced a community manager in the show and she's dealing with a lot of like negativity. <laughs> And like, she's just trying to keep it together. And I just think we're so lucky as community, working community in the education kind of sector, because that's not what we deal with. If there's ever 
anything negative. It's all in the pursuit of making something better. Really, our community is there for one another. And our job is to thoughtfully listen and to take feedback and take it to the team so that we have real conversations around how real teachers are using Class Dojo. Because for us, it's never been, I mean, Class Dojo has always been free for teachers. So it's never been about that bottom line of sell, selling accounts or anything. It's been about how can we make education amazing for every child and family and teacher. So I just think, yeah, we're really lucky to be working community with educators because they're just amazing people. <laughs> yeah, I think I, it reminds me, if, if, if any, for anybody who's in the CMX Slack community, there's a channel in there for people, for community managers that work in gaming that, and you go in there and That's it's like really different one. <laughs> it's horrifying. <laughs> Whereas when we get feedback, it's, oh, I love you guys, but it would love if there's yeah. never someone coming through real harsh. It's everyone's here as a community coming together in the pursuit of something better to make education amazing for all children. So Caitlin, I also, I appreciate you talking about what your goals are and that kind of I think it's a good intro into the next thing I want to talk about, which is how do all y'all measure success in your communities? I wonder if you can talk about kind of how you measure success and also how you, how your organizations measure success. And if there's tension between those, how you balance that. Okay, yeah. Wanna... Yeah. I think there's always like a pressure to have some kind of number to back you up. And it's really hard to quantify the impact of your community. Uh, a lot of what I do is like leading with my heart and what I know from being deeply involved in my community. So trying to transfer that information to someone higher up and to communicate how important it is. Luckily, they trust me and understand and we, we all are very connected on what it means. But our measurements are a little bit more fluid. For success for me, what I think that is, is our community being active. That means people are asking questions and members are answering them, not me. And people are responding in a way that reflects our community guidelines. Even if the question has been asked like a million times, someone's not like, here's the help desk. They're saying like, ooh, like this help desk really helped. This article helped me out. Oh, and here's a little best practice to get you going. So that, that's really what success is for me. Across our organization, though, having a successful community means we're driving teachers to activation. They're using Class Dojo, all the parts of it, as well as driving growth. So an active community is a user who's using the product, but they're also sharing it with others. That's, what, that's what's unique about Class Dojo in general is that when teachers love something, they share it. So when our community is successful, we see growth at the school level. And, and do you have way, particular ways that you're measuring that when you're, when you're looking at your community? I tend to use, so because our community, I consider it to be outside of our Facebook group as well. I do use some of the tools within Facebook to track our community across time, but we put more trust in our actual, like looking at growth across time mm -hmm. uh, rather than looking at our community specifically because it's such a small fraction of what right. our community is. Awesome. Lisa, how do you measure success? Yeah. So I, Caitlin's comment about measuring engagement uh, couldn't... Uh, resonate with me more. So our, uh, this is a big conversation we've been having actually just last weekend with our board of managers, but also over the last couple of years. So the work actually happens like in the one-to-one -one relationship. It's so personal and it's so um, relational and in our case, global. So how do you wrap your arms around that and try to quantify it? Something that we've been working towards the last couple of years uh, is that very thing. And the metric is we measure participation ultimately in these four modes of engagement that have been identified by the um, case, the Council um, for Advancement and Supportive Education. And that guidance alone and these mo modes of en engagement ha were pivotal in our work because finally we have something to work towards. But, but we are also smart enough to know that it's not just increased participation that shows success. It has to be a meaningful instance of engagement. And so we do track satisfaction following each event program instance of engagement, but as leading uh, indicators towards overall loyalty to the university that we measure using MPS. So ultimately that's what we're trying to drive is loyalty to the university. And, and it's, we now through it have visibility into some of that data and we can see how our efforts are impacting that. 
So one of the things that one of our board members shared this weekend is, I wish it was my quote, it was not, but it was insightful. Uh, she said, we lead with data, follow with heart. And I think ultimately that's what we're um, aiming for. I like that. It's a really nice way to frame it. Medina, how do you measure had success? No, I absolutely love that quote, lead with data, follow with heart. That's fabulous. I might have to rip off of that and use it. <laughs> so being a smaller organization, we just really got into using the data. I think it's super important. Numbers are very important. So we do a twofold thing. Engagement, I think, is always important. So I think for Kate and Lisa, like it's similar to us. We The numbers matter. And we're finding that engagement is really hard for us as well. And so we're looking at all the analytics within Facebook and IG, all of those things and watching how they trend. But does that actually translate to them commenting and liking and sharing and all of that? And so it's like, how do we get that to work for us? And so one of the things that we need is that we do twofold. We have a baccalaureate scholarship program. So everything that we're putting out, we see that you're liking it. We see that you're reading it, but then does that translate that you're actually applying? Does that translate that you're actually um, attending our meetings? So we're wanting to grow that. And so success for us is saying, hey, we're putting this out here, but then are we raising the money that we need to raise? And so year over year, we are seeing growth, which is a great thing. But then in some places and spaces, like we went from having in-person meetings where it was just a handful of folks to now we're doing a totally different model because of pandemic. We're seeing that this uptick of 50 and 60 and 70 people on, you know, our Zoom calls, which we think is fabulous. But then we have this total dip of no engagement on our social channels. Mm -hmm. So now how do we balance this out? It was a brand new problem for us. How do we measure success is now we have to figure out what the problem is. <laughs> and that's where we are right now. So we're having, it's a little bit of a conundrum for us and figuring out what that looks like. We're a much smaller organization and really trying to break into what our metrics is for success, but knowing where we want to be. And listening to both of you, I'm learning like, hey, maybe I need to schedule one-on-one -on -one with the both of you and learn from you all on what you're doing and what you guys have found to be best practices, because it is important for us to learn what that looks like. But when we think about the more soft skills of what success looks like for us, it is more the heart. It's being able to do things like when a grandparent comes to us and says, hey, I, and I had this happen, grandmother came and said, I need a clinician for a mental health, you know, um, worker for my someone who looks like her so she has a sense of belonging so i went out and found that information for her and she was eternally grateful and i felt so honored to be able to give that information to her because it strengthened our relationship and it helped build community so that's the type of success we want but how do we measure that yeah you know so it's, it's difficult um, to quantify those types of opportunity but we do it often so how do you measure so we're learning, we're growing, and we're trying to figure out how we put those things in quantifiable numbers. It's awesome. I think I certainly, certainly hearing that story and thinking about that, I think we've all been in situations like that. We're like, there's no way to put a number on this, but this is the reason that we're here. And yeah, thank you very much for sharing. So Lisa, I want to start with you with this question. You know, thinking back, we just finished crazy here. The crazy seems normal now, but, but 2021 was a, was, a, was an eventful year. What was your biggest challenge in 2021? And how did you address that challenge? Just one. We had, yeah, 2021 was a, a, a rough year. We should all be proud for making it through it. So I would say the same challenges everybody else has. We had to do like an immediate shift or pivot was the, one of the buzzwords to virtual engagement. And so we had done a few things in that space before, but that was a whole different beast that we quickly had to become good at. And we're still learning how to do it. So virtual programming, hybrid, hybrid programming. And so it was all of a sudden we have had all these plans for these wonderful in-person events. And then it was just done. It was gone. And how do we still create meaningful 
opportunities or way for alumni to connect with each other, not just for the sake of, of, of saying we're doing it, but like they needed each other too. So I, I would say that's, that was our biggest challenge, but ultimately we did it, we got through it. And I, I would say it resulted in well, it, what it, if you're on diet, it's a non-scale victory. Uh -huh. We, so one of our programming has been very patient-based. And so being, we were considering how to expand it to other campuses for a, a little bit of time prior to the pandemic. Now in 2021, our hands were forced and ultimately we did what we were tr trying to figure out how to do. Ultimately, we scaled our program by moving it online and now have attendees globally, whereas before it was only available in Bloomington. We did see some wins there, but I would see it, say the switch to all virtual programming in 2021 was the biggest challenge. Second to that, I think across the nation, and we there was a, a feel of staff staff turnover or vacant positions, like a lot of people left the workforce. So we had a little bit of that in 2021 as well. So now that you've made that big switch to 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 virtual events, are you going to be are you planning on maintaining that as a as an element of your program? We are because I, I don't think it's going away. I think people there is a bit of Zoom fatigue. But I think people want to get back to in-person programming, which we have done appropriately since then. But I do think the accessibility and the ease of access is really a huge benefit with virtual programs. programming. Yes, we're continuing that, but it's in addition to bringing back our in-person programming. Caitlin, what was your biggest challenge last year and, and, and how did you challenge the challenge? Tackle it. Take it yeah. on. Yeah. 2021 was the most challenging, personal and professional, was like one of the most challenging years. And then to win the community professional of the year for education was like mind blowing because I felt like I was just trying to keep my head above water. I, because COVID really challenged our teachers and our teachers' challenges really become our own. Mm -hmm. It forced teachers to like totally relearn how to be those amazing teachers they are. And then we wanted to be able to support them. So in doing so, we saw this like massive influx of teachers joining Class Dojo. And so we very quickly stood up a training page and hosted webinars for thousands of people at a time that walked teachers through how to use Class Dojo, how to apply it remotely, how to use best practices. I was creating like content and hosting these. And it was really just like a year of nonstop support for me. So I think that, that like, our teachers' challenges were our challenges, and that's really what it was. How can we best support them? And then similar to what you just said, Lisa, that like people had some burnout around just being online. Like we got tired of Facebook, we got tired of Zoom. So it's we're trying to reach you in the, the way that makes the most sense to you. At the same time, people were like, do not show. It was a challenging year for community in general when everyone was like, I need to step away from my computer. Mm -hmm. How did you, how do you feel you navigated that? Do you feel like, do you feel like your community is com coming through intact-ish, stronger? Yeah. Yeah. I think our community also had this massive influx, like our users in general for Class Dojo had massive influx, but our community had an influx. So it was really uh, about helping them understand what our community was about. How do we speak to each other? How do we support one another? Where to find all the resources? So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of cool to see us come out the other side where we're all semi used to this remote, but in person back and forth that everyone stepped up. Our, our mentors were supporting those who are brand new and our community is still like this strong supportive space. It's awesome. Yeah. Medina, what was your biggest challenge last year and, and how did you address it? I think we're all going to talk about COVID here. <laughs> this pandemic has been one of the most challenging and isolating times. So as I mentioned before, previously, post pre-COVID, we only had a handful of folks showing up to our in-person meetings. It was largely due to like scheduling conflicts. Families had so many obligations and traffic and just all of those overwhelming household obligations, you name it. So when the pandemic actually hit it, we had to change our perspective on how we were going to engage them. So Zoom was our new innovative way to connect. And it actually was very immersive for our community because we were hearing from voices that we had never heard from before. And so we thought Zoom fatigue was going to be an issue for us, but surprisingly it wasn't. Yeah, it, we were completely surprised about it. 
because I told you, I said it before, we were having like 50 and 60 people showing up because it was new for them. Could turn off their camera if they wanted to. They could voice their opinions. We were using jam boards in our breakout rooms. And so we did, that wasn't our challenge, right? It was actually this breath of fresh air. And so we're like, wow, this is amazing. We have this great model. We're solving this problem. Beautiful. So we thought, great, this is going to now translate to our online social channels. They're going to put up surveys. They're going to respond. When we put posts and ask them to share it, they're going to respond. They're going to communicate with us on our forums and our blogs. Radio science. Mm. Looking loose only. Yeah. And so that became our challenge for yeah. 2021. We could tell like from our analytics that they were clicking and they were reading and they were watching the videos, but they just would not actively participate. They wouldn't give their voices, their opinions. They would not reshare. We were just like, well, I won't even engage. I don't know that you see the information because you're showing up to the meeting because that's when we post information. But we couldn't understand where the block was with this engagement. And I'm going to be fully transparent and honest here. We have not solved it yet. <laughs> <laughs> we are still looking for this engagement roadblock fix. So if either one of you lovely ladies and gentlemen would love to share your fix, I am all ears. Caitlin, Lisa, you got a fix for Medina? No, I, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. That <laughs> I have like, I'm thinking through, I'm like, I was very much like nodding. Yes, these are real, these are real things we've encountered. So I don't know if I have a cool fix for you. It's just, it is, it, I think. What is my, what if I, somebody just appears and starts talking and then you're like, then you, sh then, then you just shower them with attention. But yeah. The person appear though. They just one do. Thought, I have one thought. Do you have a group of like your all-stars experts that like support your community outside of just like your, like yourself and anybody on your team? Cause sometimes having the, like the people on, like on their level, another parent, another student as like the rock star, so to speak, that can support them sometimes helps. Yes, like champions is what I call them. There you go, yeah. yeah. I do have a couple of those that I could say, hey, would you mind just Gosh. going in and a conversation? Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any shame in 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 seeding the ground with, converse, with, with, with pre planned conversation. Okay, not a bad idea, actually. Thank you. I'm right there. So now that we're on the topic, Looking forward to 2022. Medina, what is your biggest, what is your top priority or your top priorities for the coming year? I'm glad you asked that. That's a really good question. So our top priority for 2022 is sharing more stories that highlight our community members yes. directly from the community. So as an owner of I Spy Marketing, and every Friday, we highlight a business or emerging leader, someone from our community that basically or round of applause that says to them, hey, you're doing an amazing, awesome job and we just want to highlight you. So I want to bring that same exact model to the BPA community to really help them get to know one another and learn more about who each other is. Because I truly believe that when you know about your community, it brings about more connectedness and it helps tie each other together. And when you know those things, you're stronger together, and then you can create the change that you want to see in your community. And that's what I think BPA needs. And I also think it will help them feel more comfortable to talk to one another, engage with each other. So I'm hoping that will also fix my engagement problem. <laughs> that's awesome. And I think people will really love learning more about the, the other people in, in the community and those people that you highlight are going to, going to be so appreciative of the chance to have their, their voices elevated. Yeah, I think so too. Caitlin, what is your, what are your biggest priorities for the coming year? The reason I had an idea for Medina is because my top priority is we have this longstanding mentor program that with this influx that we had needs a little bit of cleanup, a little shot of excitement and going back and re-looking at life cycle emails and touch points. So I'm really hoping to better design or adjust pro our program so it allows me to run it all without manually running it all. So I can focus more on the highlighting mentors who are amazing and connecting people and working on the stuff that really 
makes us feel connected. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to, do you have plans for how you're going to highlight, help highlight awesome leaders? I have some ideas. I don't know if I want to spill them all. No, just kidding. Oh, sure. uh, the, here's the trade secret. No, I think just giving people an opportunity to like showcase how, okay, so think about teachers. We can only progress so far in our roles. And to go beyond that is to be what principal, it's not the same thing. So I feel like teachers are always looking for a way to like up level, but still be connected to their classroom and where they are. So I want to find ways to shine a light on the amazing things that they're doing in the classroom and for their community. And that might be showcasing them on a landing page or asking different mentors to write for our blog, doing some kind of social media shout outs and maybe not takeovers, but like allowing them to share the content they're creating mm -hmm. because it's really about them. So I have some ideas, still playing around with it. If anyone else has ideas, I'm also all ears. Awesome. I think that, and that just being like highlight the work they're doing, it's that, that, that's like, how do you support it? How, how can a teacher be progressing in their, visibly progress in their career without leaving teaching? That's a big, that's a big issue across education. I think it's a really interesting thing to be like thinking about how to like help in that. that yeah. That. Teachers are constantly growing and mm -hmm like up leveling their game. Think about all the teachers who just learned how to be remote teachers mm -hmm. or now tech experts. Like how do we take everything we learned over the last year and share it with one another and really shout out those teachers who are doing amazing work for their school community for and beyond that. Lisa, what are your priorities for 2022? Yeah, that um, really resonates with me. We, our community, people want recognition. And then they want it from, they want it from us, especially in a sea of almost 750,000 alumni, like it's it, being recognized by their alma mater. It feels nice for the, either the great work that they're doing in their communities, which is so impressive. Or if that is for the work that they service, their volunteerism, that they're giving back to the university or their donations that they're giving to universities. So that's the recognition piece is a big part of, of our stewardship model is stewarding that relationship with the university. But I would say um, internally, let me share another quote with you that is not mine. My boss, our um, CEO, shared publicly, and I get behind this initiative. Our focus this year will be to align attention, resources, and creating a culture of accountability. So we're really trying to lean into that data, that quantitative data piece that we just recently uncovered or organized in a way that we can gain insights from it and use it. That is not to take the relational piece out of the engagement, but how do we use it to make smarter decisions ar around how we engage people? So I'd say those, so those two things are our focus this year. Awesome. All right, come to the, the last question I've got planned. And this is the quit. This is not the time for y'all to be humble. So. Each of you are amazing. You've been recognized as being amazing by CMX, which counts for something. And so I want to know what your secret sauce is as a community manager. What, are, what is it that you do awesome? And, what, and, and even better, if it's something that we could also aspire to be awesome at as well. Lisa, you want to start? Yeah, I'll share what we collectively, my colleagues and I are good at as community managers is coupling that data piece with the, we've done a lot of empathy research. I don't know if anybody's familiar with design thinking, but we took a couple of years to really do some qualitative research on what our audience uh, wants from us. I know uh, Medina spoke about that earlier, like they really listened to their audience and put into place what they tell them they want. As someone who is personally better at the quantitative side, I really appreciate that about our organization that we are trying to uh, lead with that, but also like balance uh, some of that with the data piece. So in terms of what I am good at personally, I'm in the nerdy space, the, the data, the logistics, the analytics. I like to think that's what I bring to our organization, but what I am proud of about our collective community management is balance of both. Awesome. Caitlin, speaking of awesome, what makes you awesome? Well, we'll be count the ways. No, <laughs> I think there's two things. There's one part you can't steal. Maybe you can, but I think as a human being, I think a lot of community managers are deeply empathetic and that really makes a huge difference. I'm also, my husband's in the military, so we move every three years. So I feel like I'm constantly seeking my own community 
and craving community. So maybe that's just the personal stuff that others can relate to. But I think what makes like the secret sauce of our community is that not everything has an ROI or fits into priorities. Every now and again, you drop everything to create a visual with Mojo, who is hugging a koala bear during the Australia fires. And you send it to teachers to be like, let us know how we can support you. Little things sometimes have a huge impact. And some of those things are purely delight. And you won't, won't have numbers to back it up, but it'll mean the world to those people, whether that's hopping on a call with them and doing a read aloud with their students or doing a career day. Some things don't have an ROI and that's okay. Awesome. I love that. What's your secret sauce? So this question was really hard for me, actually. <laughs> I had to really think about it because I don't ever really talk about myself this way. I just being honest, I think that my secret sauce is that I have a knack for kind of making people feel seen and heard and valued. I'm really able to speak their language. It doesn't matter like who they are, where they're from, how they are. I'm really able to see to the core of what they need. It's like you speak Spanish. I'll speak my broken Spanish to you. Doesn't really matter. And like that type of gift helps me like raise money, you know, for the organization. I raised fifty thousand dollars last year for our baccalaureate, and we were able to get seven scholarships to graduating seniors. And that money was raised from like our foundations and our churches and past recipients, and like that giving from our amazing donors. Like without it, we couldn't have done what we did. So we are exceedingly grateful for that. But at the end of the day, it's like my secret sauce is like building authentic connections along with the combination of these amazing people who want to serve and it creates such an impactful outcome for our students. So I guess like the bottom line is I value like meaningful long-term relationships and connections with people over transactional encounter. That's my secret talk. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank all of you for sharing and joining us uh, today. It's been, I can't speak for anybody else, but for me, I've really, I've, I've enjoyed it. That's what really matters, right? It's just, thank you. I think I'm sure everyone has been, has really appreciated all y'all's time and getting to hear about your experiences. We've got a few minutes left. Love to throw it open to, to folks who have been listening to if you've got questions for our amazing panelists. This is your chance. Eli, I don't know if you've seen anything in the chat that you want to bring forward, or if there's anybody that would like to speak now, we'll, we will turn your camera on and you can ask yeah, questions yourself. And of course we can always throw you on camera too, if you're feeling us in the for today. So yeah, we pull out a couple things here from the chat that I'd love to feature. So let's just go through here. First of all, we've got some great comments here. I think Jessica really captures so much about what's important about this kind of space where we're all able to have these small group discussions with our fellow education managers, how we can support our community. That's why we're here and I'm grateful both to our expert panelists today, all of you for attending, because I desperately need community as someone who creates community for others, from that thing to be fed myself in turn. We've got another question here. So yeah, we've got a comment here about uh, from Jennifer actually. He says, my two sons' grade school teachers use class dojo to send notes and photos of the class throughout the day. They found it super helpful to have conversations with the kids about what they actually did during the day. The hardest pulling the teeth question any parent has, we've all been on both sides of that in many cases. It's really helped to get them to pass the one word answers from them. So yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for, for that. That's super helpful feedback as well. I think when I kind of, one that kind of connects to that, because all, all our parents will say, oh, what'd you learn today? And you get the, oh, nothing. Instead, you're like, oh, in class story, I see you built a volcano. Tell me about that. But Quine, and I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, asked like, how do you incorporate parents into the dojo community? Which is a really good question because really our community isn't just teachers. It is families and students. And in the past, we've had their own Facebook community, but it's not something that was incredibly active. But what's really interesting is we find there's a very much a crossover between teachers and families because a lot of those teachers are also parents. So everything we do is very transparent. I think that's the key is that you share everything you're working on, you ask for feedback, and we're hoping to continue to build our community more specifically to families in the future. 
since we have such an established teacher community right now? Because I don't have a great answer, but it's like TBD. <laughs> so I've also got Jessica, who might be able to come on camera, who had a question about leadership opportunities for students. I mean, Jessica, two seconds. I'll oh, sure. I'll end right. Sorry, guys, I'm in my gym clothes. I was <laughs> just curious. Medina, if you could talk about the leadership opportunities that you create for students within your online community. Sure thing. So what we do is we offer a couple of programs throughout the year for students to actually lead. So we use them as our co-host for our unity in the community. So they moderate the entire program. They also help come up with topics for the program as well. And then we have what we call the State of the Student Summit, and that is a completely student-led forum that they host. Next week program on the back end where they learn how to create a virtual um, event. They have to invite their cohort, their students. They learn how to make the flyer for it, how to post, how to advertise. They learn all the back end, how they come up with their agenda and all of that. So then we also ask them to come up with other events that they feel relevant for the rest of the year. So they create programming for themselves as well. And then our graduates from our baccalaureate scholarship program, they come back the next years and they also come back to do mentorship to the current high school children, or excuse me, they're my babies. <laughs> <laughs> leaders to come back and mentor to the students who are in the program. So it's a cipher that they go through. So that was amazing. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. We've got another question coming in from Samer. Um, go for it. Yeah. So this is mostly, I think, for Caitlin and Medina, and that's that both teachers and parents are segments of the larger audience that are incredibly busy. And even more so with the pandemic, I've never seen them both pop both segments as stretched as they are. And it seems to be a lot of just in time troubleshooting and really ignoring everything else. So how do you cut through that busyness to get their attention on for things that are important to you, but maybe not necessarily to them, at least not to the same degree. Yeah, that's a really good question because they've never been busier. It's been them relearning how to teach and at least speaking to teachers specifically, I think one, one thing is meeting them where they're at. So that's why we've always kept our community on Facebook because so many people in general use Facebook in their free time versus putting it somewhere that's very work specific. So a lot of the like community work that we end up doing might be through emails and in-apps, but also in the Facebook community where they can interact with each other. Because they, as they relax for the day, it might be scrolling through Facebook for a little bit and that's where they can interact with things. But yeah, I don't know if Medina has more to add for on the family side, but I, did, I think that's a challenge across the board for everyone. Absolutely. We try not to inundate them with emails. We use something called Thought Exchange. It's really simple. So it's a platform where we ask a simple question. They're able to put in their thoughts and then they can rate other teachers or parents thoughts. So if something resonates with you, you can rate it. And from there, we get the themes that we need to address and cover. So it's really simple and they don't have to put a lot of effort into coming up or writing a dissertation about what their needs are. But then I'm also a part of other groups that the teachers are already a part of. So I meet them where they're at so they don't have to do any to come speak to me. I go to them. Yeah. And I'd have gone to that. I think like you, you have really like a ton of emails and inundating them. It's like, where do you get your information as a teacher? And it's really supporting one another, like their own, even just school community where they're sharing information. So as class dojo, we have mentors, hopefully at every school. And if we can share something with a mentor who's maybe a little more of our, you know, power user, excited to be there, wants to be involved, then if we give something to them, they can share that uh, with their community at their school. And with that, I just want to say one last time, thank you to, to all of our awesome panelists and thank you to everybody else who's attending, who, who came and attended today. And also thank you to all of you who are watching the recording of this as well. We really appreciate you taking part.